Kia ora tato. We saw last time that finding the connected components of an undirected graph is simply a matter of running a standard traversal. But this approach does not work for finding the strongly connected components of a digraph. In this lecture, we'll start by looking at an elegant solution to finding the strongly connected components of a digraph, which makes clever use of DFS and runs in linear time. This is known as Tarjan's algorithm. So let's try and think a bit more about how we might find the strongly connected components of some digraph G. Let's start by supposing that the underlying graph of G is connected. So ignoring the direction of the arcs, G appears to be in one piece. This is sometimes referred to as the digraph being weakly connected. But suppose that G is not strongly connected. This means that there are strong components, C1 and C2 say, such that it's possible to get from C2 to C1, but not from C1 back to C2. That is, any arcs between C2 and C1 solely point from C2 to C1, and there are none going in the other direction. If there was one or more arcs going from C1 to C2, then that would mean C1 and C2 are actually just a single strong component going against our assumption. So this argument can be made for any strong component of G. So we can draw G like this. So this shows each strong component of G and only the arcs that connect them. And there may be more arcs here that we're not showing, but notice that they all point in the same direction. Indeed, we can think of this as representing a new graph. Let's call it H where the nodes of H are just the strong components of G. So the nodes of H are C1, C2, up to CK. And if you think about it, H must be a DAG, a directed acyclic graph, as if it had any cycles, all the strong components on that cycle would just be a single strong component within G. So let's look at this. If we start a traversal in the strong component C1, we'd reach all nodes in C1 and exclusively nodes in C1. Then if we chose a node next in C2, we'd visit only nodes in C2 as following any arcs across to C1 would lead only to nodes that we've already seen. So we could continue in this way and eventually find one by one all the strong components of G. And in fact, the same would apply if we were looking at the reverse of G, GR, which obviously has the same strong components as G, and we could draw it like this to get HR. So if we were looking at the reverse graph GR, if we could start a traversal in CK, and then start the next part of the traversal in CK minus one, and so on down to C1, we'd again find all the strong components we were looking for. It seems though we could only take this approach if we already knew which nodes belong to which strong component, which seems somewhat circular as that's what we're trying to find out. But actually, we can apply what we know about DAGs like H to tell us where to start and how to proceed. Okay, so since H as a DAG, we can find a topological order of H using DFS. Recall to, that to do that, we simply run DFS on the graph in question and list the nodes in reverse order of done times. So a topological order of H looks like, so we have CK down to C1, and we can find that by running a DFS on G and li listing the nodes in reverse order of done times. Okay, so you can check the details there. Now we'll start a DFS on the reverse of G in CK simply by picking the first node on the list we just derived. So the first node of the list will be something in CK, we can pick that node, and once we've finished exploring CK, we'll pick the next unvisited node on the list and that'll be something in CK minus one, and so on. We can continue in this way 
and produce a search forest of trees that can correspond exactly to the strong components of the reverse of G and therefore to the strong components of G. So let's write that down and then look at an example. Okay, so this is how Tarjan's algorithm looks. We run DFS on G, we record the finishing times for all nodes, we list the nodes of G in reverse order of finishing, so this is as if we were finding a topological order of G, although there's no assumption that there is a topological order of G. Then we'll run a depth first search on uh, the reverse of G, and we'll choose the root nodes, the starting nodes, the nodes which we call DFS visit, at the first unvisited node on the list from this step that we just that we just constructed here. And this will produce a forest, let's call it FR, where the trees in that forest correspond exactly to the strong components of G. So let's look at an example. So the first step of running Tarjan's algorithm is that we run DFS on our graph. So I'll do that recording scene and done times as we go. So we'll start at node zero at time zero. We'll move to node one at time one, down to node three at time two. Then we'll move to node two at time three. We're now done at node two. Uh, we return to node three and visit node four at time five. We're done at node four at six. We're done at node three at seven. We're done at node one at eight. And we're done at node zero at nine. So if we list our nodes of G in reverse order of finishing, from the last finish to the first finish, the last finished was zero, then one, then three, then four, then two. Okay, so now we want to run DFS on the reverse of G, and we're going to choose the root nodes uh, according to our list here. So we'll start our depth first search on this uh, reverse graph. We'll start at zero, uh, and then we'll visit 1, and from 1 we can't go anywhere, right? So we've visited that one, visited that one, and the next on the list is node 3, so we'll start a new tree at 3, and the only place we can visit from there is 2, right? Because 0 and 1 are already done, so 3 goes to 2, and once we're at two, there's nowhere we can go. So we've done three, we've done two, four is next on the list. We'll start our next tree there, and that's as far as we can go. So we've got uh, three trees in our search forest, corresponding to zero, one, two, three, and four. And that, you know, that translates directly up here as well. And you can check that they are indeed the strong components of this graph as we wanted. So what's the running time of this algorithm? Well, we start simply by running DFS on G to get an ordering for the nodes of G. So that's, you know, big theta n plus m. This is just listing the nodes, so that's quick. Um, we then need to run DFS on the reverse of G, which means we need to derive the reverse of G. It's easy to see that that's also order n plus m to get the reverse. And running DFS again is just theta n plus m. We're just adding these three things together. So overall, we once again just get a linear time algorithm, um, big theta n plus m. So although the problem of finding the strong components of a digraph seems much more tricky than finding the components of an undirected graph, it turns out they can both be solved in linear time. 
So let's look at one more application where cycles are interesting and where we can take advantage of the properties of traversals. This time we're interested in so-called bipartite graphs. So let's start with the definition. So a graph is bipartite if the vertex set V can be partitioned into two non-empty disjoint sets, V0 and V1, so together they make up all of V, such that each edge has one endpoint in V0 and one in E1. Let's look at an example. So here's a graph with six vertices. If we partition them into two sets, uh, this side and this side, then we see that all edges in the graph have one endpoint in one set V0, the other in the set V1, and so it's clearly bipartite. In this case, it's obvious by the way that I've drawn the graph that it's bipartite, as all edges have one end, one endpoint on this side and one endpoint on the other, and we can just look at it. And it will often be the case that we will know by what the vertices represent that the graph is bipartite. For example, vertices may re represent customers and employees, and edges show which employees are assigned to which customer. Or a graph might show the male and female of some species, and an edge represents a mating pair. But we may not always know when a graph is bipartite and when it is not. We may want to verify that a graph we've been told is bipartite actually is that. In these situations, how can we find whether or not the graph is bipartite, and if it is, find a bipartition. First, note that we also say that bipartite graphs have a two coloring. That means we associate a color with each of the partitions in the graph. So for example here, we might call these vertices white, and these ones pink. Now we can prove a simple result. So the result is that a graph is bipartite, so it has a two coloring, if and only if it does not contain an odd length cycle. Okay, so we're going to prove this first by assuming that if a graph is um, bipartite, then it has no odd length cycle, and then we'll show the converse that if it has no odd length cycle, then it is bipartite. So first, let's suppose G is bipartite. Then any cycle in G must start and end on the vertex of the same colour. And since edges only exist between vertices of different colours, the length of any cycle must be a multiple of two. We've gone from one side to the other and back again, and back again. Right, so, that, so we've got an even number and there are no odd length cycles. So that's pretty easy. Okay, now let's prove the converse. Okay, now we're supposing that our graph G does not contain an odd length cycle. We want to show then that it's bipartite. Let's think of running a BFS on G, and then we'll colour the vertices of G depending on their level in the graph. If the vertex is in level I, we'll colour it I mod 2. So that le level 0 is colour 0, level 1 is colour 1, level 2 is colour 0, level 3 is colour 1, and so on. Okay, so we've got something like this. You know, we, we've run our BFS. Let's colour every second one pink. If we can do that, it's all well and good. Since this is a BFS on a graph, edges either go between vertices on levels that differ by one, so they'll have different colours, like I've drawn here, and that's okay. Or they'll go between vertices on the same level. But suppose we had vertices U and V, which were on the same level, say these ones, U here and V here, and they were connected by an edge. Well, it turns out that that would create an odd length cycle. And where does that cycle go? Well, here it goes, um, from the root of the tree down to U, across to V, and back up to the root of the tree. So we'd get a cycle of length 2 times the depth of U, which is the same as the depth of V, plus 1, which is odd. So we've got a contradiction, so this thing can't exist, and our result is proved. So this proof gives us a method for finding a bipartition 
or showing that such a bipartition doesn't exist. We simply need to run a BFS, record which level each vertex is on, and that, of course, only takes linear time.